I'm going to get started. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Margaret Tando. I'm the Associate Dean for Diversity and Inclusion here at the Learner College of Medicine. I'm very uh, pleased today uh, to welcome everyone to the fourth, I think it's fourth, there's a debate. I don't know. I can be corrected. Whether it's the fifth or the fourth? Fifth. Oh, it's five. Okay, I was wrong. <laughs> Fifth annual Vito Ibasiani, MD85, and George DeSavo LGBT, LGBTQ um, Health Equity Lecture. Dr. Ibasiani is here from uh, California, and we'd like to welcome him and again say thank you. <laughs> he and his spouse um, have generously funded this uh, series of, um, uh, uh, of uh, lecture. Today, though, I'm very, very excited. Um, when I met um, Henry uh, a little while ago, but I really met Henry um, many years ago because Henry and I trained in the same um, institution. So I was very excited to uh, see him. Uh, we have Dr. Henry Ng here today, who is the chair of the uh, Department of Internal Medicine and PEDS at uh, Case Western Reserve University. He's also the uh, past president of uh, uh, GLAMA, is the gay and lesbian Medical Association Health Professionals Advancing LGBTQ Equality. Um, Dr. Uh, Ng did his undergrad and his medical school at uh, Michigan State. Are you guys Spartans or Warriors? Spartans. Spartans. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's coming from somebody that went to Grinnell College. We were the slugs, so. <laughs> So he, he went to um, Michigan State for, um, um, for both uh, medical school and um, undergrad, and then he did his um, med piece training at uh, Case Western Reserve at uh, Metro Health Hospital. Um, and this is where I actually worked with him um, at Metro Health in Cleveland, um, Ohio. In 2012, he got an MPH um, at Case Western with the emphasis on um, health, health promotion and uh, disease prevention for LGBTQ um, uh, population. He is um, an associate professor at Case, and he's also the assistant dean for um, admissions. Um, Dr. Ng, um, in 2007, actually founded the first, uh, um, Ohio's first medical home for LGBTQ uh, uh, patients. He also has some um, academic interest in LGB, LGBT health, health disparities in uh, public health uh, and uh, population health. He is the associate editor for the uh, journal LGBT Health and has um, directed the um, uh, clinical elective at the uh, Pry Clinic at uh, Case Western since 2008. Um, he has numerous um, awards of which he had the, um, he, he was awarded the Leonard Toll Humanism in 2009, and he also received the uh, Gender Equity Award in 2016. I'm very um, honored and glad to uh, present my friend uh, Henry Ng to um, deliver our fifth annual um, Ibasiani lecture today. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Can you all hear me? Excellent. OK, so continue to eat and chew and swallow. Do not aspirate. I do not want to trach anyone here. <laughs> Reminding all of you, I'm trained in internal medicine pediatrics. I'm not a surgeon. You don't want me to trach you with a pen. <laughs> OK, very good. We have the, the remainder of the hour to talk about a smattering of topics in LGBTQ health. And I am really honored to be here. Uh, to share with you my little bit of the experience so far, and hopefully um, maybe some of the lessons that I've learned may inspire some of you to do some work in this area in the future, because I'm looking at the future of healthcare in this room. I'm depending on you, and everyone else is too. All right, I was a chief resident, so I should be able to work the clicker. Ah, oh, it works. Okay, so my disclosures, um, I don't have any relevant financial relationships. Anytime that I talk about hormonal care, uh, this is uh, FDA non-approved and is considered off-label. My current positions are as listed. Uh-oh, let's screen back on. Wrong button. 
So hopefully at the end of this session, the attendee will be able to do all these things. That's a lot of stuff. But we're gonna talk about some terms and language. We're gonna talk about factors that can improve transgender health delivery. We're gonna think about all the different things that intersect uh, institutional environmental and policy factors that help us deliver better care to sexual and gender minority patients and especially transgender individuals. Um, we're gonna talk about developmental, psychological, social, and medical health concerns of transgender people and we're also gonna look at some best practice approaches. And maybe you can think about three ways that you might be able to incorporate some of the things you learned today in your work. But I'm gonna tell you a little about me. Um, so I outgrew the hair, and I lost most of it. Um, I like to say that's because of med school and mostly my residents that I work with now. But I was born in Hong Kong, um, this little island that is on the southern part of China. I was naturalized along with my mother in 1984. I was born in 1974, the year of the tiger. And um, growing up, for me, recognizing that I didn't identify with a lot of majority culture was something that I became very sensitive to. And I think that's one of the things that made me sensitive to the experiences of my patients when my patients were telling me that they too felt different and that they too at times felt othered. <coughs> Because I could relate to that to one degree or another. I had these things called lunchbox moments growing up. Anyone know what a lunchbox moment is? Raise your hand. <gasps> okay, besides our faculty. Oh, and my Asian API folks. Hey, in the house. <laughs> Anyone want to throw out there what a lunchbox moment is? Don't worry, this is a safe place. No one's going to judge you. Well, I might judge you a little bit. <gasps> yes, exactly. What is that? Oh my God, that's so gross. It smells. Can I trade you for that? <laughs> That's actually the response we get these days. Like, ooh, that looks really good. Can I trade you? But growing up, like, you know, I kind of wanted what everyone else wanted and everyone else had around me, which was, you know, sandwiches and other things and apples and fruit. And I'm like, I'm bringing noodles and rice and other stuff, which I didn't always fully appreciate my family of origin and my culture of origin until much later. And so I think, again, some of us who are coming from multicultural, multi-ethnic backgrounds kind of struggle with that bit of you know, assimilation of identities. And it heightens our sense of what it's like to feel a little bit on the outside sometimes. Okay? So that was one of those things. And, and I didn't actually have a metal tin, although this is a really fancy type of thing. Um, mine was actually like in a little green thermos, um, which I always broke. I kept on dropping it on the ground. So I was a clumsy kid. Um, I was born, uh, I lived in Rockford, Illinois, the home of the sock monkey. I thought that was like a really wonderful fact to share with all of you, now you know. And so my life has really been, you know, the juxtaposition and blending of multiple cultures and especially Eastern and Western medicine. So, you know, like other children, I was plagued with sore throats and ear infections as a child. And my mom would drag me off to go see Dr. Liu, who would prescribe me the wonderful bubblegum tasting pink stuff, right? everyone's favorite moxicillin. But at the same time, you know, my grandmother would make like these herbal soups that tasted like feet and laundry mixed together. <laughs> they were horribly bitter and really stinky. But I was told, and growing up, this was good for me. So again, putting all those pieces and parts together and recognizing that there wasn't just one face of medicine, there wasn't just one way to do things that there are a lot, I, now I have words for this now, at the time I couldn't talk about, oh, there are multiple health beliefs and you can have different points of view and different cultures and it'll be intersectional. That's what we talk about now. But my little six-year-old self just realized that there were just a different few ways of doing things and it all made sense because it was all part of what we experience. So I go to medical, uh, to undergrad in medical school and you know a lot of, uh, things happen to, to us during college years. You get exposed to thought leaders and people who make a big impact on your life. One of those for me was Le Munois. Um, some people may know who he is. He is a, a gentleman who spent a lot of time talking about culture, race, ethnicity, at a time when it was really focused on race in the 90s. And he had a documentary called The Culture of Fear. And this was among once one of the first formal, academic, but real life forays 
into this topic that I had as an undergraduate student. And I was trying to wrap my brain around what it might mean to be an African American in today's society, but not having that type of experience. I don't have that lived experience, of course. You know, I had friends who were black, but I'm not black. You know, growing up to be Hispanic, Latino, et cetera. But getting people together in a room and videotaping real life conversations, I, I, this is available for you to see on YouTube. I'm not, I don't make you any from it. But do take a look. It's timely. Even though the topic hasn't changed, or rather the, the content of, the, of, of what they're talking about might have changed, the issues that we talk about are still timely to this day, is what we're seeing around the world. Okay. And then there was Madonna. I don't always put Madonna in my academic slides, <laughs> but I too was you know, amazed by this person who was a performer when I was in college. I thought, wow, this is a really cool person who's doing all this really neat stuff and she's dancing and all this stuff. Voguing, what's that about? But not, yeah, exactly, face, 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 duck lips. <laughs> but I didn't learn about the story behind that until sometime after college. When I was exposed and finally learned through other friends who widened my perspective about ball culture. Who knows about ball culture? Raise your hand. Hi. Thank you. All right, so a few people throughout the house do. So for the rest of you who don't, ball culture was a way that sexual and gender minority people, mostly at that time, transgender and gay individuals, some lesbian, identified and shared and expressed who they were in a competitive dancing environment while creating structures of houses to support each other. These were houses of chosen family because oftentimes their families of origin had rejected them. I become emotional because to this day, our patients experience the same type of rejection. And it gives me pause. But the strength that our patients get when they come together and they create family and that is what is shared with us when we see them in clinic. Pierce's Burning was a story about ball culture. It was a documentary, and again, it's something that I encourage you to consider seeing if you haven't. It's very eye-opening, and the networks of safety and of relationship and of family bonds are something that, again, to this day, are very important for all of us to acknowledge and respect, especially as we think about the diversity of the patients that come into the healthcare system and how we engage with both their patients, those patients, and their families. And when I say families, we're talking about families of choice as well as families of origin. So ultimately, you know, this talk today will focus on elements of culture. And I really like this uh, definition that the American Academy of Pediatrics uses of culture reminding us that this is the full spectrum of values, behaviors, customs, language, race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, religious beliefs, social, economic status, and other distinct attributes of population groups. And we also have to think about how all those different pieces and parts of culture are different for every single person. This is the hard part of medicine. None of this is easy. You think the Krebs cycle is hard? Whew. Talking to patients is hard. Why? Because we have to learn how to relate to somebody and figure out what their story is and to understand where they're coming from and to sometimes navigate and, mis and, and try to avoid miscommunications. And all those things are predicated on previous experiences in healthcare as well as societal experiences as a group of people altogether. So intersectionality reminds us that the experience of any one person is certainly gonna be different from all those others, in part because the experience of an African-American gay man is gonna be different than a transgender Latina woman. 
because you can't separate any of those parts and pieces from each other. It is the totality of these multiple identities that intersect to create the whole that is different from the component identities. And you can see all the list of the elements. So I'm having all these ideas and thoughts now swimming in my head as I've gotten through college and I actually go to medical school and I, I, I was lucky enough to get into a combined undergraduate graduate program that's now defunct. But it was, at that time, it was called the Medical Scholars Program and allowed us to get through medical school and actually focus on things other than physiology, biochemistry, anatomy, and that stuff. So I really took advantage of the chance to take language and linguistics, music, sociology, other things that ultimately I found out that were very helpful in allowing me to learn how to better relate to other people, especially my patients to this day. I ultimately ended up doing a residency in internal medicine and pediatrics, and in my fourth year of our residency, we were required to give a talk on some scholarly activity, some topic. And I decided that I wanted to talk about LGBT health. Now, this wasn't a, you know, kind of an idea that I spiritually decided to do at the last minute. I actually had given this a bit of thought. I'd asked faculty, I'd asked other students, I'd asked other residents. I'd found out that in our community in Cleveland, Ohio, that no one had talked about this topic in the at least in the last 10 years. So I thought, you know what? If I'm gonna go down, I'm gonna go down my way and I'm gonna go down flaming. Because I don't do anything half. I thought it was important. I thought it was a gap. I realized I was becoming passionate about this. This was important to me and important, I, I believe, to the patients that I would be caring for. So I thought, you know what, let's give this a shot. That opportunity really opened up all the other doors, giving that talk. Uh, I was lucky enough certainly to be at a hospital that had an aligned mission to my own personal mission and goals. And ultimately I pursued a master's in public health at Case Western and every single opportunity opened up another one. Dr. Vassiani and I were talking a little bit this morning about kind of like this invisible pathway that there is for academic scholarship and promotion and kind of like your life course and career. Um, not everyone sees it. And I remember as a medical student, I had no clue. I was just thinking, I just need to get through the next exam. Let me please survive neuroanatomy. But there, what I can tell you is once you finish, there's something bigger and greater waiting for you on the other side of med school. It's called residency and patient care in real life. And that's when, yeah, don't be too afraid. It's important to be able to utilize everything that you've learned up until that point. And you will recycle and throw away about 30 to 50% of it because the facts will change because of science. That's okay. But the part that will not change will be the interrelational pieces of how you communicate, interact with others, those similar and different from yourselves in both visible and invisible ways. And as you become more adept at doing that, you have leadership opportunities that open to you. It's really true. The more you do and do well, they'll ask you to do more. So one door opened for another. So being able to work on a project where I was the medical director for a homeless youth van for three years set up the stage to open an LGBT health clinic, which gave me the opportunity to become an invited lecturer early on to talk about LGBT issues in a few settings and present about them. And then you'd be asked to serve on a board of directors for a national organization. And then when you become all of a sudden this national expert that I was never prepared to be. But then that opened up opportunities to serve on different types of commissions and meetings and other types of technical groups. So the leadership path is there. It's for you to see it and find it and for you to continue to do your very best and move forward and go after it. But I do believe that each and every single one of you in this room can achieve that. Like I said, you are our future. So with that said, I'm gonna move and talk a little bit about the meat of today's talk, which really is about sexual and gender issues. Now for those of us who identify inside of the community, we have our LGBTQ plus community here, um, and then folks who are kind of on the outside as allies. Um, I, I think that one of the challenges is recognizing that the language is forever changing. Um, young people, including the people in this room and those younger than you, I don't know what we're called the next generation after millennials, but whoever they are, 
they will be testing our boundaries and understanding of gender and sexuality in ways that we don't even understand now. Most of us are trying to catch up and try to be able to become masterful with the language of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender. And what's this Q stand for? Is it queer? Is it questioning, et cetera? You know, we're trying to become adept at that part of the language. Meanwhile, many of you in this room are already living with all these other identities that are part of your day-to-day -day experience. But not everyone understands what scoliosexual means, or demi-boy, or demi-girl. My message to everyone is that you don't have to necessarily become a master of all these words. Like what you learn in medicine, some of these things will change and some of them may go away. But the bottom line is we have to remain open and aware of the evolving language around gender and sexuality and be able to reflect that in a meaningful way when we engage our patients. So in this particular lecture, you are all here because you've been compelled to come. <laughs> That's why I usually tell our students when I give the lecture on LGBT health. Um, but another reason is that you know, we have a lot of quality care issues and LGBT people are part of this community. They're receiving health care already in many of our health systems around the United States. We are either doing it in a good way or maybe not so good way. And it gives us a moment to reflect and think about what we're doing well and what we could do better. Certainly we have codes of professionalism and uh, various uh, uh, certifying, uh, certifying bodies that remind us how to do our jobs well, and certainly our patients also have an opportunity to voice their concerns more and more when they tell us that we may have done something that is maybe not with the intent to make them feel unwelcome or unwell, but that was the impact. So depending on what we do and how, con and how concerning or egregious that may be, you know, that might affect us even financially and may cost someone their quality incentive. I work as a chair of a department. I look at quality scores of our uh, physicians all the time. Communication's right up there. If you don't have respectful communication for your patients, it doesn't matter how many patients you saw, it doesn't matter how well you diagnose their health and problems, chances are they're not gonna come back and see you, your quality will suffer, and you're not gonna be rewarded for that type of care. So where does all this stuff come from and why do we have to talk about it? Well, historically, we don't have a society that's very different in medicine or health than greater society. Studies in the 80s and 90s identified that at least a third, if not more, of respondents in primary care and surgical subspecialties held negative views about sexual and gender minority people. But we've seen, you know, certainly more inclusion, at least on TV, of LGBTQ characters and whatnot over the years. And we can see that's actually really growing. We have LGBT in the one, two, three, four, fifth area. It's gradually increasing from the period in blue 2006 to 2007 up to the uh, far in yellow 2013 to 2014. Um, contrary to other groups like African American, Latino Hispanic, um, and other non-white individuals who are decreasing. But does that mean that the world is that much better, shiny, glittery, fabulous? Not necessarily. I mean, we certainly have seen the ACA and marriage equality, ACA being Obamacare, which is still the law of the land. <laughs> That's all I have to say about that. But despite that, um, 2015, we had a New Jersey Supreme Court case that looked at issues of having to uh, address providing uh, conversion therapy for uh, both adults and minors. And this went up to the state Supreme Court to rule that this was inappropriate and should not be offered, despite the fact that homosexuality had been removed from the DSM in 1974 as a pathology. Things aren't so glittery and wonderful yet when you have pediatricians who can decline taking care of a baby who has two mothers. This happened in Michigan in 2015 also. Um, Michigan and 34 other states of the union have uh, these conscience clauses and um, they're now becoming more and more associated with RIFRAs or Religious Freedom um, Acts and they allow individuals to not participate in care of individuals um, or allow access to public spaces based on uh, one's religious beliefs. Even this week, 
we have heard about how there is the rescinding of recommendations and regs from Health and Human Services about the care of LGBT people for the National Strategic Plan of Care moving forward in this administration. Health and Human Services has removed all references to LGBT people, their unique health needs from government websites. So just think for a moment, are we better off just because Will and Grace is back on TV? All right, let's move on. We're gonna talk about Trans 101, okay? So in order to do this, we need to talk about the construct of sexuality. So there are four constructs I wanna make sure that people are comfortable with. The first is sex. Um, so when, so you guys are first and second year students, no one's done the words yet, right? Bueller? Okay, thank you, appreciate the answer. All right, very good, still awake. Um, so, just imagine it. You're in third year, you're OBGYN. You're working with a mom, she's laboring. Push, 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 finally one big push, boom, out comes the baby. So, we swaddle the baby, we stim the baby, we dry off the baby, make sure the baby's breathing fine. Cord is clamped, the mom's partner cuts the cord, and then we hand the, the baby off to the parents. What do we say? We say it's a boy or a girl, right? How do we figure that out? Look at their genitals, very good. It's not a trick question. Okay. So historically, we just look at the genitals, we make a decision based on the anatomy that we see. Okay. So we assign sex at birth, is the point. You have the presence of a penis and testes, we've assigned sex male. You have the presence of a vagina and a vulva, we've assigned sex female. We have scrotolabial folds and a sinus and a phallus of indeterminate size. Congratulations, mom, you have a baby. Now, short of this being congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which can be a medical disaster, uh, and the minority of cases are that, it can be a social emergency. Because we live in a binary society that has blue and pink. So this is a challenge that we have. Sex is certainly has been by, um, defined this way. When we have that condition of we're not quite sure, historically this was a term that was used to describe an intersex condition. Now you're gonna be hearing about differences in sexual differentiation or DSDs, or a person who is DSD affected or living with a DSD. But I wanna make sure that you're comfortable with that first concept and construct, sex. Mind you, we didn't talk about anything other than your anatomy, all right? If I don't know what your sex is based on your anatomy, there are additional other tests that can be done. For example, the uh, figure there with all the lovely rainbow colored chromosomes, okay, our chromosomal sex studies, and other types of uh, laboratory enzyme studies that you can do. Who you are is your gender identity. This is your sense of self. When you close your eyes and you just think about yourself. Do I see myself? as a masculine person, as a feminine person, someone with both, masculine and feminine elements, one more than another, somewhat equal. Am I masculine and to some degree without any femininity, but not as masculine as other masculine men might describe themselves? Am I demi-male or demi-female as the case may be if you're thinking somewhat feminine, but not masculine in any way? So this middle space of a combination or actually some uh, we'll take this uh, spectrum and split it so that it's not in two directions. It can be just one directional with a gender being a start where you have nothing. Gives you a sense of how you see yourself in the universe. That's your brain. Your gender expression is the way that you show the rest of the world kind of who you are. So if you have the infographic here with the gender bread person as a cookie, this is the icing, all right? Now, the icing on the cookie, you know, are you thinking again, we're gonna do a little binary here. Is it pink icing? Is it blue icing? Is it purple icing? Is it pink on top, blue on bottom, vice versa? A smattering of all? Is it none of those things? Okay. Your way of expressing to the universe who you are and how you see yourself, which is also culture bound, depending on which culture or cultures you identify with, 
and what masculinity and femininity mean in those cultures is the way you tell people what your gender expression is. I found this lesson particularly painful in my first year of working in clinic. Now, mind you, I thought I knew this. I started this darn clinic, right? So let me tell you, be humble. I had a 60-something-year-old patient come into clinic. And this patient presented in a very masculine way, had a masculine-sounding Western European name. And this was before we kind of changed our internal processes of how we identify. We didn't have pronouns or anything like that at that time. So I introduced myself. Hey, Mr. So-and-so, I'm Dr. Ring. It's so nice to meet you. How are you? And welcome to clinic. How can I help you? The patient's first words to me were, well, nice to meet you. I'm transgender. I'm here to transition. I thought, wow, I just really screwed that up. I had a great opportunity to get to know you better and align myself, and I made this assumption about who you were. As we had more of an interview and I talked to this patient, I found out that she, because that was a pronoun she liked to use, that she used for self-reference, that she didn't know what to expect at our clinic. This is the first time she had come. She came from a community that was very conservative. She would present as feminine amongst a small group of friends in the privacy of her home and her friends' homes, but wasn't comfortable presenting in a feminine way everywhere. So what this taught me was that gender expression also will vary. It depends on the environment that you're in. It depends how comfortable you feel. And it may not be congruent with the way you see yourself in the universe. So it also reminded me that I can't predict who's going to be trans and who's not when they come to clinic. So that uniformly changed the way that I and everyone in our clinic engages with patients from that point forward. Finally, sexual orientation is the last construct. Um, this is a construct that oftentimes is a little sticky. It, it's a binary construct. It works really well for people who identify as you know, one thing or another, but not necessarily, for example, if someone identifies as male, sex assigned at birth as male, and they're attracted to men, women, and transgender women, but not trans men. What exactly does that make them? They're healthy sexual beings. They don't necessarily have to have a label. So a word like gay or bisexual or homosexual might be helpful and useful for some individuals, may not be useful for everybody. Also remember that these terms can be generational. Not everyone uses them in that same regard. So when we line them all up, we may see them as in this 2.0 version um, where we take the spectrum and split it so that it's not in a binary way. It goes into a direction. Or of course, anytime they can introduce a unicorn, we have unicorns. So this graphic is per, um, given to us by the Transgender Student Education Resource. Um, again, the same type of idea with the construct of gender identity expression presentation being directional in the sense that you can go from nothing toward male, female, um, or other genders. Your presentation can be female, uh, masculine, or other. Your sex assigned at birth can be male, female, or DSD intersex. And then certainly you can be sexually and romantically attracted to other genders included with men and women. And we also need to think about those individuals who are of non-binary identities. I learned at a recent Glamour conference last month that amongst some Native American tribes that there can be as many as nine different genders. That just blew my mind. I thought that was amazing. Okay, So there are other constructs and other ways of living and understanding that go far beyond the binary. And our job, again, is not necessarily to master all of this. Just be aware that there might be something outside of our own experience and box and be open to that. Also be aware that the emergence of gender issues can happen very young. Uh, do you like my cartoon? OK, so this goes along with like going to shop at Target and other stores that describe when you buy a toy. Is it really a boy's toy or girl's toy? Thank goodness that most people recognize that they're just simply toys. You know, a G.I. Joe action figure and a Barbie doll are both dolls, OK? And you, you're, you may have children that may have a preference, perhaps, for one type of doll stereotypically over another. And we may see that persist 
and some of these children may be transgender one day. We, we don't know. But one of the things that we always you know, tell our parents who have some gender atypical kids, or in our clinic we say gender awesome kids because they really are awesome, they're amazing, wonderful kids, um, is that it's fine to play with all these different toys. Just make sure they're for children and not for adults. So I'm not gonna repeat the slide. You can see it for yourself. Another thing we should also think about is the cross-cultural experience of being a sexual gender minority person, um, especially being transgender, for example. There are different cultural places, statuses, for folks to have in various cultures around the world. Whether we're talking about Native American and Two-Spirit people on the bottom right-hand corner, the Hydra of India, who actually occupy a legal distinct uh, category of the third sex, or the top middle photo of an individual who identifies as a Katui or lady boy from Thailand, or people who are from Mushe, Mexico, or rather who identify as Mushe from Mexico. Um, we oftentimes hear those stories about you know, Thomas Beatty, the pregnant man, other salacious types of stories, but you know, just remember that there are other lots of day-to-day -day stories that we don't hear about, and there are also stories from people from all over the world with an important lived experience where they're being trans or simply not being cisgender. We don't necessarily equilibrate their experience to being Western transgender. Um, is something different and important to recognize and understand, and it may affect their health. So when we're in um, clinic and we talk about health care, especially for transgender people, you know, like everybody else, we're thinking about supportive care, primary care, you know, how do you take care of people and make sure that they get all their vaccinations? Did you guys get your flu shots yet? I got mine, it hurt a lot, but get it anyway. Um, you know, get your vaccinations, standard age appropriate care, sexual health care. Um, in clinic, we talk about gender affirmation, which is another way that we talk about um, transitional uh, care that patients may request to need hormonal medication management, surgical procedures, but you know, people who identify as transgender may also have some lived life experiences that are not always positive. They may experience violence, they may experience discrimination in a number of different areas. They may or may not have a lot of resources, community supports, uh, people supports uh, that can help them be successful in their health and taking care of themselves. And they're also uniquely challenged in the sense that their documentation and legal name and gender may be uh, not always congruent with the way they present. And that can add to other layers of challenges. If you have a name and a gender marker on your ID that doesn't match how you present, in certain states, you can lose your job. If you don't have a job, you don't have health insurance. Now, health insurance is not the only thing that can keep you healthy, but it certainly helps. You can also be evicted from your home in those same 35 states. So what do you do when you find yourself potentially jobless and homeless? Oh, the, the different types of uh, drop-in centers for homeless people aren't really that keen on having trans people there, and neither are their shelters. So where do we go? Our barriers in healthcare are not necessarily any better. 25% of transgender people are denied coverage for routine care simply because they're trans. Another quarter are denied coverage for hormones. And then over half are denied coverage for any type of transition-related surgery. A third of transgender people have experienced negative, uh, uh, has have, have had a negative experience with a health professional because they are transgender. This may include things like physical assault. Nearly a quarter have not seen a physician, one needed because they're afraid of being mistreated, and a third have not seen a doctor because they couldn't afford to. And this was a survey, a national survey of transgender adults between um, ages uh, 18 and 70 that occurred in 2015 with an N of over 3,000. So we learned that our trans patients are refused treatment, experience verbal harassment, physical sexual assault, and then also find themselves at times in the unique and vulnerable position of having to teach a provider about transgender people in order to get the right kind of care. 
imagine how ridiculous that is. Imagine having to go to the cardiologist and having to teach them cardiac physiology because they didn't know it. So we do that all the time when it comes to sexual and gender minority health. And this is happening for more and more people, especially as more and more individuals self-identify somewhere in the spectrum of sexual and gender minority status. So the Gallup poll tells us around 3.4% of US adults identify as LGBT, especially as people are younger, up to 6.4%. And the Williams Institute report says around 3.5% identify as LGB, another 0.3% of the US population identifies as transgender, but many, many millions more people have same-sex attractions and experiences. And our recent uh, polling of adults tells us that this number continues to increase, especially among younger individuals. So this is really important when it comes to healthcare, because again, we have more and more diverse people coming into the healthcare systems needing supportive care, needing hearing care. Um, this is one of our colleagues who points out when healthcare has barriers and healthcare isn't hearing. So, um, uh, one of our, our, our colleagues who's been doing trans health for uh, a while and trans activism pointed out through this uh, campaign called uh, Trans Health Fail, hashtag Trans Health Fail, that there are lots of opportunities to miss the boat when it comes to taking care of transgender people. And this was one of the quotes that Parker Malloy shared as he was having his experience with healthcare. He wrote, there was a time I had to take a pregnancy test before getting a chest x-ray despite lacking uterus. Trans health fail. And then some other examples. A nurse who was talking to a patient, when was your last period? The patient saying, me? Never, I'm transgender. The nurse says, oh, you really fooled me. I thought you were a woman. Trans health fail. I saw a special psychologist for ADHD assessment who asked me about my surgical status. What exactly does one surgical status have to do with your ADHD treatment? And that sounds like some form of morbid curiosity. That objectifies individuals. That's not caring. Trans health fail. A nurse tried to call me back for my appointment, but then shouted, that can't be you. This chart says male. <laughs> Trans health fail. We police bodies. We legislate bathrooms. And I say we as the grand, we as society. We see people die in nightclubs, intersection brown people, intersection LGB people. And people get an uproar when people take a knee. But people are being killed. And this is 2017. And this is a global health issue. This is a human rights issue. We can make this better. We have to make this better. So what can you do? Recognize that all these pieces and parts are important. Affirm patients when you can, every single time. When you get a chance to actually hit the wards, check out your electronic health record and see how inclusive it is. Make comments, make strides. Make it inclusive. Create workarounds. What have we done? This is what we've had to do over the years. We use Epic, which is an electronic health record. It's pretty good. It's about half of the, the uh, electronic health record out there um, in terms of usage. Um, but we, for, uh, for a while, had been and still use intake forms that allow patients to tell us what their pronoun is. They tell us about their relationships, important people to them. They tell us that they're a preferred name. Now people are talking about how to even change that field. Is it your affirmed name or the name you go by? Whichever one, that's okay. But maybe not the legal name. They tell us about their health information. We talk about informed consent for their hormonal care and what to expect when you come to clinic. And then we've created transgender health packets that have specific information relevant to our patients and their concerns and their needs thinking about what their needs are from their health perspective. And we provide appropriate referrals for all different kinds of subspecialists. We talk about their medication needs and common ways to administer them, including how to give yourself a shot or injection. 
because that's actually a big piece of that. Medical students like you guys are a big part of our clinic. My colleagues tease me all the time. They're like, where is your entourage? Because we usually have four to six students at every single clinic with us. It's amazing. It's wonderful. You guys keep me on my toes. You're always making me learn. You're always making me stretch. And in return, I get to give you the exposure to work with sexual gender minority patients so you can hone your ability to interact with them better. In our clinic, we make sure that we have a didactic to talk about basically this kind of stuff and language ahead of time and talk about things that our students are worried about, which is usually centered around screwing up. I don't want to make a mistake and make a, a problem. And then how you recover from that. So we practice language introductions, interviews, sexual history, et cetera. And we practice giving and using pronouns because pronouns show respect. We started a pronoun campaign. So I'm actually wearing one of our buttons. Okay. And our staff wear buttons, our patients are offered st stickers, it's voluntary, no one's forced to use it, but it gives our patients an opportunity to talk about what's important to them, including their pronoun if it's important. My introduction completely changed. Hi, I'm Dr. Ring. It's nice to meet you. I go by he, him. How can I help you today? Simple as that. How should you be called? Around trans health, I just want to make sure that you're aware that there are three different, uh, there, there are actually uh, recommendations for the different types of medical care and interventions. These are outlined in something called the WPATH or World Professional Association for Transgender Health Standard of Care uh, recommendations. And they're broken down uh, for our patients in terms of physical health and mental health. And under physical health, we have reversible, partially reversible and irreversible procedures. Um, we usually think about partially reversible as hormonal care and irreversible procedures as surgical procedures. Things that are fully reversible would include things like the use of LHRH agonists or um, progesterone to suppress estrogen or testosterone. If we decide to delay puberty, we'll be using GnRH agonists like Lupron um, that will be injections. Um, yearly implants or histerlin. These will suppress the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis, things that you guys have, may have learned at this point. And it prevents LH and FSH from rising, therefore you don't get your estrogen and testosterone secretion. So these are things that are started for our young people when we meet with them and we decide as a team, we have, we have a team of individuals who work on this um, at sexual maturity rating too. We'll delay puberty for some of our young people. They can be helpful because it will delay secondary sex characteristics that individuals may not want. For example, a young trans man may not want to ever have breast development because then he'll have to have breast surgery perhaps because that's not the way he wants to present. But some of the challenges from these types of treatments may include pain for injection, weight gain, and the cost in getting these to be covered by health insurance. That's still always challenging. And a lot of us are spending time on the telephone arguing on things called prior authorizations which are special permissions to basically get a medication, get it paid for. If you're talking about testosterone for um, different types of masculization therapy, do recognize that we have both topical as well as injection forms that are basically gradually given over periods of time at increasing doses and patients are medically monitored. Same type of thing goes for feminization therapy, that they're both oral forms, transdermal forms, and injection forms, and also we provide an anti-androgen which is a type of medication that can both suppress as well as block the effects of circulating testosterone in the periphery. We also ask about silicone injection use. Some of my patients do use this. I just had a mid-40s patient come to me who was on what some people call do-it-yourself hormonal care. She was using hormones at a frequency and dose a bit higher than what was recommended, and she had a history of having silicone use. So we talked and counseled her about some of the future things that could happen, including scarring, migration, and even autoimmune phenomenon that can happen many years down the line. Medical complications are not common, but they will occur more with people who are using do-it-yourself hormonal care, including the use of ethanyl estradiol, which is a form of medication that is in oral contraceptive medications. That's why the general recommendation is to use 17-beta-hydroxy estradiol, which is the kind that is found in all other medications like estradiol valerate or estradiol acetate. Venothromboembolism is the most likely uh, problem to occur 
in individuals, especially in the studies that have been done looking at this as a particular outcome. This usually happens in older individuals as well as individuals who are otherwise tobacco smokers and users. It's still not common. And the most common association, again, is using a form of estrogen that is in oral contraception medications. So this lovely slide summarizes um, from, the jam, from JAMA um, all the different types of medications and doses, et cetera, that you may be able to use. It's available on the slide set for those of you who are really curious about how to dose all these medicines when you're in clinic. But I think more importantly is just recognize that if patients are transgender, are they taking medications? And if so, are they taking doses that are within some type of therapeutic range that makes sense? You don't necessarily have to be the one who's prescribing it, but is what the patient taking making sense for what they're achieving for their overall physiology, or does it potentially put them at risk for another type of health problem? That's what it's gonna be important for you to think about. So I'm gonna actually blow through the best practice very quickly. This is not as important, I think, for you guys yet because you haven't hit the wards, but just recognize that the electronic health record can be created to have various fields that allow your patients to have different parts of their identities, their physical anatomy included and listed so that we can better care for who they are. It's really important to have that, whether it's included from our perspective or from the patient's perspective using a MyChart portal, for example, where they can enter that. Do we have time just for maybe one clinical vignette? Okay, great. I wanna show you, if we can do, maybe we'll do two. These are super short. We'll show you what things can look like if we welcome people at the front desk and things are not quite, not quite awesome. You may recognize one of these actors. I hope that they do. Hi, welcome to the gynecology clinic. What can I help you with today? Um. I have an appointment to see Dr. Smith. For a gynecology exam? Um, yeah. Okay, and what name do you have? Um, it's George. George? Do you have another name that patient file may be under? Um, well, I've been here before, but not to this clinic, so it might be under George Ann. Okay, let me see. Okay, I was able to find it. What's the reason for your visit today? So um, I'm seeing Dr. Smith because I'm having some bleeding down there. I'm having some vaginal bleeding. Okay. And what pronouns would you like for us to use for you today? Um, I prefer he, he, his, him. Okay. I'll be sure to write that in down for the doctor. Would you like to sit in the waiting room or would you prefer a private exam room? Um, you know what? I think I prefer the private exam room today. Okay. We'll set that up for you. Great. Thanks a lot. I appreciate that. So these are videos through the American Academy of Medical Colleges that we created in 2014 and 2015 to look at many different elements of sexual and gender minority experiences, and this is not an uncommon one. To have to go to a clinical service where your presence is somewhat incongruent to the presence of other people there, and how do you mitigate that? I played that actor, and I was physically uncomfortable in that space. So again, what are we doing to help our patients feel welcome and feel more comfortable when they need the care that they need? Because I could have continued to defer all that. Then we'll do this other one real quick. You may see this actor also. <laughs> This is what happens when you screw things up. Tony, hi, I'm, I'm hi. Dr. Henry. It's hi. nice to see you. Nice to see you. I'm glad to meet you here in clinic, and I uh, understand that you're here for a new patient visit. I am. Awesome. So what I'm going to do is ask you a series of questions that will help me understand, hopefully, more information about you and also how I can best serve you to keep you healthy. Okay. okay? Um, Tell me a little bit about yourself in terms of any health issues or concerns that you've been told uh, that you have. No health issues or concerns. Um, high blood pressure is a thing in my family okay. um, on the maternal side, but okay. I haven't 
come across any gotcha. issues. Like mom has high blood pressure. Okay, gotcha. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, have you had any surgeries of any kind? Uh, no. Okay. No. And how about any allergies to any medicines? Uh, no allergies. Okay, great. And um, are you taking any medicines right now? Uh, no, none at the moment. All no. right. And tell me, um, let's see, are you single, married, do you have a boyfriend? Uh, no, I'm, I'm single. You're single, mm -hmm. all right. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, when's the last time that you had a menstrual period um, and pelvic exam, pap smear, that type of thing? Um, haven't had that. Um, I really no. I ever no. I no. I that's don't have that equipment. Hmm. I'm not sure I understand. Uh, what do you mean you don't have that equipment? Uh, I am a trans female. Oh, I'm sorry I didn't realize that. So I just be careful. I was a little offended. Um, not a little, very offended. So. Oh, I'm, I'm very sorry. That was not my intention to offend you or put you off in any way. Um, I certainly want to be able to take care of all types of patients who come to see me, including trans patients, and um, this is certainly an area where I think I need to learn more. Um, I apologize, though, Thank for you. offending you, and I hope you accept my apology. Thank you. Um, At least you said maybe sorry. Maybe we should back up and start over a little bit, and I can try to work with you to ask some more sensitive questions about who you are and what your health is like. Is that reasonable? That would be great. Yes, please. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's start over now. And some discussion questions, some things and factors to think about. Feel free to consider using these as part of your education content. So I'm gonna wrap up here just by just putting on to your plate again the resources that are available for you, whether they're national organizations like GLAMA or um, organizations like the health, uh, or rather the human rights campaign that puts out the Health Equality Index that will measure different types of pol uh, policy and other types of uh, institutional practices to see is your organization to some degree LB LGBT friendly, affirming, et cetera. Um, it doesn't necessarily measure what the interaction is like on a you know, provider to a clinician and a, and a patient level, but it gives us at least a higher view of you know, what types of things patients are, um, might be looking for in terms of inclusion. PFLAG is always, uh, I think, a great resource also. There are texts, there are books that have been written um, that try to address LGBT health issues, including the Fenway's Guide, Lesbian Health 101. Um, uh, this particular text that's uh, been put together by a couple of colleagues of mine, um, Dr. X. Strand and Aaron Field, um, did this one on LGBT healthcare. This is one that I always share with my patients. We have several copies in clinic, and I really bring it into almost all visits I have with uh, transgender clients and patients. It's uh, our Trans Bodies, Trans Cells, which was written by trans people for trans people as a guide to having a trans body and living through living life with that body as that person. And I, I think it's one of the most helpful resources that's uh, out there. It's not perfect. Even the editors will like, admit that they didn't have the um, plurality and diversity of all the voices that they want. So, you know, the next iteration hopefully will be even better. But it's one of the best tools that are out there, especially when some of our patients are finding themselves very socially or otherwise isolated. Um, their health journals, including the one I serve as an AE for, so if you're interested in research, um, please submit. There are online resources from different types of uh, websites. You can spend a couple hundred hours reading through these guides. I don't recommend it. Um, bisexual health is really important and oftentimes gets sidelined, so um, important to highlight that, as well as a number of resources for trans health. Again, you'll have a, access to the slide set, so you'll be able to review them at your leisure. So to close, I just hope that you all rec realize today with our talk, there are some, I think, basic lessons that, that 
we can think about and that we can use on a day-to-day -day basis. And it all boils down to communication and respect. Pronouns matter. We listen and we listen with empathy. We speak and we speak with respect. We practice cultural humility, meaning we allow others to teach us things from their perspective, and they don't have to be a PhD or an MD or anything like that. They have a lived experience that we don't understand and know, so we can learn from them. There are lots of resources that are available, so please use them. Be familiar with whatever resources you have in your own home community and be able to re, uh, use those and refer patients. And then finally, discrimination in healthcare is a health hazard. And with that, I will stop so that we can take questions. But thank you very much for your attention. And again, it's been an honor to be here as your speaker. Thank you. Ah, there we go. Much better. So I will now come to you as you have questions because I've always wanted to be Oprah Winfrey. <laughs> Okie dokie. As, as I come to you, please identify yourself for me since everyone else in the room might know who you are, but I may not. And I'll try to do my best to answer your question. Hi, I'm Pam Gibson. I'm one of the faculty members um, who, as part of GLMA have gone to meetings and learned about what EPIC can do with the sexual orientation, gender identity information and the modules that are available. Do you have those modules now at, um, at Case Western? So our hospital went live with our most recent update. So the question was, do we have the uh, updated med uh, EPIC modules that are inclusive of sexual and gender identity uh, variables, you know, so whether we're taking these in on the front end for demographics or on the tail end where we're the providers and we're kind of checking off the boxes. We have it on the tail end right now. So we do have the ability to identify and uh, after our patients tell us, after we've sensitively asked, of course, what do you consider your sexual orientation to be, your gender identity to be, what, anatom what anatomy do you have, and we can note those things, and they're um, part of our searchable uh, uh, health record now. So we're just rolling that through, and, we, and also just to let people know, we're just rolling our um, pronoun campaign out also. Other, I think there was another hand. Oh, okay. Uh, hi, I'm Harris, I'm a second year medical student. Um, my question was, uh, in terms of your clinic and you just as a professional, like how do you handle an adolescent who comes to your clinic who, who is, you know, kind of confused or they feel like they identify themselves with the LGBTQ community, but they know that, you know, they're part of a conservative family. If they do identify, like they're going to be rejected and kind of shunned. So is there like a standard of care or like what are you supposed to do? That's a great question. So what do you do with the questioning adolescent who is in a less than supportive environment? I look for safety, number one. And this is actually something that's, that's happened for me um, several times in my career. If you, what, one thing I've always learned is when you ask nicely and you ask genuinely and sincerely, patients will eventually tell you something. They may not tell you right away, but they will eventually tell you. So this was a case with a 15-year-old um, uh, Puerto Rican boy I was caring for for a number of years. And mind you, this is a kid I clocked as gay many years ago. However, he needed to come to that realization of who he was. And when I repeated the question as I do every year, asking about are there concerns or rather are, have you um, developed any feelings sexually for anyone at this point, and he told me that now he identifies as gay, I said, that's great, I'm literally glad that you sh felt comfortable sharing that with me. Who else have you told? So we start asking about disclosure. So we find that an individual has disclosed to multiple individuals and friends and family, that and they're getting support, that's one place. 
but if they feel like they really can't disclose because, for example, they're in a very religious or conservative family where their personal health, their safety, or their housing may be threatened, I really counsel them to be careful about how they want to disclose should they share at all. Because unfortunately, well, more importantly, the most important thing is the safety of that person. I'm most concerned about that. Now, we may be in a situation where the mental health of that individual from not disclosing may also come to a head and become a crisis, at which time then we provide as many social supports for the family members as we can. And we also review and encourage uh, the benefits of full love and acceptance of your child. And the data shows that good things happen when family members are able to affirm and love their family and their children for every part of who they are. Okay? And that negative things happen specifically when those children are rejected. We went over more hearts and minds that way, but not necessarily everyone. And I, I'd like to say that every time it is a success story, but it's not always. that before a child starts uh, hormonal treatments that you meet as a team to begin that process what exactly does that look like and what are you evaluating or discussing so in our clinic we have developed um, a multidisciplinary plan of care where we have uh, children who are 16 and below um, meet with our gender team so I, I joke with everybody and I tell the patients and their families I'm the gender whisperer I'm the one who talks about gender with with all the the young people and talk about what their goals of care are. I mean, trying to understand these are teenagers or preteens sometimes, and they're in concrete operations. So thinking back to psychology, they're young people who can think in very solid and concrete ways, but not necessarily always tap into abstract thought. So it's not always successful that we're able to talk about gender and their gender identity, because that, that really is sometimes a challenge. But that's what we try to set up a space to explore what that is. And if we already have young people who have socially transitioned, for example, they're living the life of some of themselves or affirm self, they're just not on medications, but they've chosen a name that affirms them. They have a style of dress and a presentation that affirms them. And they've done that for a while. Now, chances are this is not a phase. And we have a discussion that we have with the families about, well, what exactly does this represent? And are medications appropriate? And this is done through a series of interviews with our behavioral health, endocrinology, and myself. And then we actually all come back together and we have a group meeting about that. And then we set up a specific plan of care for them. So it's a lot more complicated than working with adults who can just simply offer informed consent and say, you know what, this is my lived experience. I identify as trans. I've been doing that for the last 20 years. I'm ready to take medications. I'm aware of the benefits, the side effects, and the risks to my health. Actually, I want to go over here for a little bit before I come, and then I go over there and come back to the middle. Uh, Henry, I, um, I was going to ask you this question this morning when we spoke. Um, how, and there might be some LGBT members of the audience, future clinicians, um, how comfortable are you with some or all of your patients in sharing some of your own story? Is there benefit in that or is there danger? I think that's a very important question. That's a mixed bag question. That uh, it, it, it evokes both transference and countertransference. So the whole idea of, and, and again, we, I think in medical school, in, in our residency training, we're taught to minimize both transfer, uh, transference as much as possible, meaning that I've made a disclosure to some degree or some type of communication that would is so personal that it influences you back on a personal level. Um, as a rule, I, I do follow that because I think that there is a personal and a professional. My patients don't need to necessarily know who's in my chosen family. They don't need to know what I ate for dinner on Friday night. They don't need to know anything about my personal life in that regard. But whatever's posted in the universe and social media and otherwise, that's public. So I also have to be mindful of what I put out there publicly. So I only put cats, food, LGBT stuff. Um, so that's what you get when you decide to Google me. Um, but I, I think that there also is a time where you can have a therapeutic alignment where there are these disclosures. I listened to a, a young medical student, um, Nick Sitkin, 
at our Glamour meeting recently, and Nick gave a really wonderful account as um, they were receiving their award for um, their student leadership. And Nick talked about how they disclosed being a non-binary genderqueer person to a young 14-year-old who was really depressed when that 14-year-old very bluntly asked, are you gay? And then that 14-year-old said, me too. And that was the first time that anyone had asked and someone had answered. So again, we create safe spaces for patients to tell their story and to give us an answer about, and tell us more about who they are. And they may not tell us the very first time, but they will tell us. So I, I think that's a tightrope to walk and we have to be careful and think about what's the benefit and are there other repercussions. Uh, I, I do not encourage people to divulge very personal things um, in terms of your personal life details or relationships. But you can make a very important statement by saying, well, you know, my partner and I have been together for 35 years and, you know, we're really happy and there is a way for you to be happy in the future as someone who is gay or lesbian, bi, transgender, gender non-binary. I've seen it happen and I believe that could happen for you. Does that answer, answer your question? Questions more over here. Okay, we're gonna go to the other side. Anyone over here? Yes, I have a question. It's not necessarily just about LGBTQ issues. Um, I, it's related though. <laughs> Um, hypothetically, let's say a patient comes in and is talking about things and uh, their health is fine, but you want to offer them more resources socially and support networks. Let's say you want to be someone who can talk to them about what it's like to be growing up queer or brown or whatever, um, but there don't, there's no real health issues. How do you continue? Can you like tell them to come back in to like talk, just like be their therapist? I mean, this is like not just about this issue. Actually, I think that's a great question. Um, it also goes into, uh, it speaks a little bit about also kind of what we do as mentors and, um, and advisors when we work with health professional students and, and whatnot, um, not, not just our patients. I think one of the things we, we don't want to do is make assumptions. Um, if I have a client or a patient who hasn't necessarily disclosed in a particular identity to me, then I'm not necessarily going to tell them all about LGBT this and that and their resources because I think that that can also sometimes be very off-putting because it made assumptions about that person. What, why wouldn't you also want to know about the resources for potentially all of your other identities that you may have and you may carry when we talk about intersectionality, right? So why would I list that one and just call out that as opposed to everything else? I think the more important thing is to get to a sense of asking, for example, you know, if I'm, if I'm a, an associate dean and I have students coming to see me and meet with me, you know, I just ask them how they're uh, doing well in school and how they're adjusting to the community and I take their cues from them. You know, if they make, you know, comments in passing, for example, about themselves and their partner, then, or even their patients doing that, then I'll ask more questions and probing questions to understand the nature of the relationship and then as we feel comfortable talking about that, we may be able to talk about um, what it means to them. Do they have an identity in a particular way? Would they have any type of need or resources? What I perceive to be their need may not be their real need. So again, I have to do my due diligence and ask the appropriate questions and not necessarily guess, okay? Back to the middle. So my name is Zach, I'm a second year medical student, um, and th this question may be opening up a can of worms. Um, so how do you balance the need to provide an opening, open, accepting, safe space in especially rural or conservative communities where doing so may risk the safety of yourself or your family? 
That is the million dollar question. Um, there, the, I live in a community with a greater population of a million people. Cleveland has 440,000 people in the city proper. So there's still, for a medium-sized American city, there's a lot of anonymity. That is very different than practicing in a rural, um, and or at least uh, much less urban environment. And that does employ different strategies. Um, there are both practical issues as well as ethics that come into play. Um, I actually had a chance to, to, po to write something about that particular question um, in Virtual Mentor for the AMA a number of years ago when they posed, you know, should a gay physician disclose and come out, especially if he lives in a rural community, and what types of particular issues are available, or rather, what, or not available, what type of issues may come up for him in that setting? Um, for example, if you're like the only provider you know, of care that still might change the relationships that you have with your patients. And some patients may choose not to see you. Will it become financially viable for you to stay in that community and practice? That may not. Yet at the same time, there are LGBT people who live in rural communities who would certainly potentially benefit from having an out provider because it could add to their feeling of safety and community and connectedness. It is a very, very challenging question to answer. And I think ultimately, you have to reflect on your own sense of personal safety and your also your, your sense of your ability to maintain that practice. If either are truly threatened, it would not be sustainable in the long run. So some in the audience may think, oh yes, you work at an L LGBTQ clinic, so all of this is relevant to you. However, I wish that you could, so I wish that you could speak to the universality of what you are talking about because you're gonna be meeting, all medical students are going to be meeting patients where they are, who they are, and you never can anticipate and have to be aware of your own biases that you bring to those interactions. So could, could you speak to the universality of what you're talking about? I, I, and I think that that's, that is actually, I could have you to give, to give the lecture. <laughs> um, that this, this is a universal experience. Every single patient is a new patient. We don't know what a patient will come with in terms of what their concerns are People don't come prepackaged with a t-shirt that says, hey, I'm gay. At least not usually, unless it's pride. I mean, patients don't come to work every, or come to clinic every single day with a wrapper or, or something like that. I would hope that over time, as hospital systems and health systems may evolve, that we can become more inclusive, that you know, pronouns and stickers and things like that, that help make visible characteristics that help patients communicate with us better and vice versa, um, become more um, commonplace adopted tools, and then frankly, we don't even think about them, they just simply are. Um, but I think part of our challenge is that with the universality of this need is the lack of education, practice, and training that we have had historically, just simply talking about sexuality, talking about gender, talking about reproduction, talking about genitals, talking about sex. People are so uncomfortable and sweat bullets when they start thinking about those terms and words and, oh, I'm gonna F up. Okay, so you're gonna F up. If you are genuine with your patients and they know that you care and they know where you're coming from and they can feel it in every single bit of you, and you may even say, you know what, I'm not an expert on this and I, I might have the wrong language, so I really wanna make sure that you know I care, so I hope that you're not offended. And guess what? Your patients won't, and they'll correct you. And that's the cultural humility piece. So it all feeds back to our need to be able to communicate in all different settings, 
in all different places. Um, I, I do emphasize that I'm actually not in an LGBT FQHC, a federally qualified health center. We created this service inside of a larger hospital. And when we did that, we actually began to change the culture of the hospital. Because more and more patients were not just coming to our clinic, but they were using all different parts of the hospital. The lab, radiology, subspecialty. Because guess what? Someone might get a heart attack and they happen to be transgender. Okay? They need to see the cardiologist. So all different parts of the hospital had to step up and become more sensitive. And we have an office of patient uh, experience where we now have a couple of community members who, are ha who happen to be sexual and gender minority identified folks who participate in that. So I, I think that we've been experiencing a gradual transformation that includes, that has had more and more visible inclusion. I'm very proud that we're doing that. And I'm hoping that that type of experience can spread to more and more health centers around the United States. Who's next? We still have a couple minutes. Yes. Hey, I'm Alan. Uh, so, um, sort of on really a topic, um, many of us are going to go into residency programs. I hope so. Across. <laughs> All of us, hopefully. Be yes. Be Let me rephrase that. Um, but I'm not, my understanding is not all residency programs are as inclusive about the language. And so any tips about surviving and passing um, while you're in this environment and thriving in this environment, um, because as you said, change is gradual. Yeah. So. Oh, you just asked the other million dollar question today. <laughs> um, that actually is a, a very, very important topic as we think about workforce diversity. Um, we had talked about how, I, I work in admissions, so we think about how we want to bring together more and more people from all different kinds of backgrounds who are amazing people, accomplished a lot, who can serve diverse communities. In, and be and similar to them in both visible and invisible ways. So part of that is also, you know, this workforce process of supporting them not just through medical school, but also in residency. And I agree, historically residencies have been lagging in terms of their ability to be supportive. And there have been some studies that look at um, residencies uh, affirmation or tolerance or support of sexual and gender minority applicants and which ones have been ranked more affirming and which ones have been ranked less affirming. Um, as a general rule, there are many exceptions, but as a general rule, the surgical subspecialties have been ranked least accepting and affirming historically, and primary care and mental health have been ranked more affirming. However, we need affirmed clinicians who are whomever they are in all fields, especially in whatever one you ultimately find is your calling. So I think what it means is that certain fields need to, you know, leverage on other ones. So if family medicine, peds, med peds, and, you know, internal medicine have done a great job, and psychiatry have done a great job of creating in these environments that are supportive of LGBTQ trainees, what can we learn from them and what can we instill and how can we have champions do the same thing in all the other residencies? And part of it is on the shoulders of the trainees. A large part of it needs to be on the shoulders of the program directors, as well as the fellowship directors, and also the um, individuals who are the DIOs. Those are the head of all the general uh, or graduate medical education programs to look at the environment of education and training. Okay. Well, it is now 1.30. You are now free to go. Thank you for being compelled to be here. I hope you learned something today. Thank you.